Um, thanks everyone for coming to the early start of our Saturday um, session. We have a full program today, uh, going all the way till 6 p.m. Um, and uh, however, let's kick things off. Um, we have Michael Mahoney here from the Institute of Computer Science, International Computer Science Institute and UC Berkeley, um, who will be talking about randomized matrix algorithms and large scale scientific data analysis. Dr. Mahoney. All right, well, thank you. And it's good to be here and glad to see everyone bright and early. So what I'd like to tell you about, I guess, is some work, you know, on, on using a certain class of algorithms to look at um, scientific data. And, and there's a couple reasons for that, and we'll talk about it a little bit. So there's a lot of hype and excitement so on these days with large-scale data and big data. And so, you know, you're on the cover of magazines like this, and so what does it mean? And so one description is, was provided in the New York Times a couple of years ago where they said, you know, what is big data? And it's a meme and marketing trend to be sure, but it's also a shorthand in some sense for advancing trends in technology that open the way uh, to a new approach to understanding the world and measuring the world and making decisions and so on. And so, as probably a lot of you know, large data are large not just because you have a factor of 10 more, but you have a factor of 10 uh, different data. And so, You know, how do you view large-scale data? So the elephant in the room is that oftentimes when people talk about large data, what they say reveals more about themselves and their backgrounds and experiences than about the data they're purportedly trying to make claims about. And so you might you know, want a bigger machine, or you might be a statistician saying you need to deposit a model, or a machine learner to say it's smooth and so you need regularization, or an algorithms person and just say it's big and so you need fast algorithms. So the idea is you'd like to get one step beyond that. And um, there's a couple of different sort of types of use cases you can imagine, right? I mean, in Internet applications where you want to make predictions about next user interactions, that's going to be different than when you have a lot more understanding about where the data come from, maybe in a different sort of science domains. And so that's one of the things we'd like to talk about. So the way I think you should think about large data in a lot of these different applications is that in, in essence it's sort of the modern version of the telescope or microscope, right? So you basically you see things you couldn't see before. And that could be movement of people, could be clicks and interests at, uh, in e-commerce site tracking packages, but it could be fine scale measurements of temperature if you have sensors all over the place. It could be you, know, you shine a, a telescope up into the sky and, and you can see the other side of the universe. So all sorts of things, whether it's people or the physical or biological world, you just have a much finer uh, measurement of that. And sort of algorithmically, in, this, in the same way as you can see the other side of the world, or the, tele the other side of the universe with the telescope, but it's hard to see five miles under the ocean, um, you know, easy things become hard and hard things become easy, right? And so calculating certain things, certainly means and sums and medians, but also things like correlations, which are more subtle structures, are very easy at small scale and, and actually become very, very difficult at very large scale. And it sort of becomes trite. Everyone says, you know, our ability to exceed data extract, uh, far exceeds our uh, ability to extract insight from it. But what does that mean and how would you actually want to extract insight? So I thought I'd have a little bit of background and, and talk about some motivators and applications, and then <clears throat> describe you know why um, certain class of matrix algorithms, or, you know, randomized matrix algorithms, have proven fruitful for um, a number of different things, um, for a number of different criteria. So they they give you the best algorithms for certain problems in worst case theory, which is interesting because it gives you some theoretical grounding, but it also um, gives you the best results of practice, and it maps very cleanly to understanding in certain scientific domains. And so I'd like to describe a little bit about that. At the end of the day, these things boil down to least squares. And I'm not going to have time to go through all the details, but, you know, roughly think, you know, if you want to do a low rank approximation of a general matrix, it's not the case that it all boils down to QR decompositions in least squares. You know, but 90% of it does, 95% of it. And so, you know, if you have a general matrix, you might need to deal with rank revealing QR and other sorts of issues, but a lot boils down to least squares. And similarly here, so I'll give you a hint of that. And the motivation will actually give you a couple particular problems, and so I'd like to tell you how you address those problems with not the least squares, but the extension to general matrices. And then just maybe a slide or two talking about how you'd get large scales. So I'm going to talk about mediumly large, you know, so you're small enough that you're in RAM, but the structure of the theory and these implementations, um, a few exist and, and, and the rest are sort of in the pipeline for getting to the large scale parallel and distributed environments. 
So matrix computations. So, you know, there's a range of different things, and so by this I mean, you know, eigen decompositions and QR and SVD, the sort of um, algorithms that underlie a lot of, of small-scale machine learning and data analysis and statistics. And traditional algorithms, um, by, mean, by which I mean, you know, things that are in LA pack or that, that if essentially you're calling if you're in R or MATLAB or anything and then call a routine, uh, essentially assume c compute exact answers. So if you're a numerical analyst, you know that you have to put that in scare quotes. But, you know, say exact is if you get 10 digits to a black box, you know, 10 digits of precision. Um, and they basically assume the matrix is in RAM and optimize flops, <coughs> you know, in, in matrix vector multiplies. So that's good for scientific and high-performance computing, but not good for certain other things. Um, in particular, not particularly good for data with missing or noisy entries, you know, as opposed to PDEs where you discretize it, and, and that's not the case in a lot of, you know, data applications. You just have missing or noisy entries. Problems that are very, very large, parallel and distributed. Think pivot rule decisions. When you need to make a pivot rule decision, there's a lot of communication there. And when you get large, computation is relatively free, and it's communication that's the expensive thing. So when communication is a bottleneck, which is parallel distributed, and when the data has to be accessed via passes, either logical or actual. So it turns out um, there's been a lot of work on using randomization, not in a statistical model, not in a Monte Markov chain Monte Carlo model, not in these sorts of things, but an algorithmic resource in the sense that I have a black box and I want to compute an answer. And inside that black box, that black box flips random coins. So there'll be a failure probability either on the answer or on the running time, depending on how you parameterize the problem. But um, this has turned out to be a paradigm that's very useful for a range of uh, types of matrix problems. And why is that? So one, at least, to faster algorithms. If you're a theoretical computer scientist and you want state-of-the-art algorithms in terms of running time and big O notation, you don't care about constants, but you like various log factors and so on, the best algorithms for certain problems, like the least squares in particular, um, will go be, for, for worst case input, will go via randomized algorithm. Um, oftentimes they'll give you simpler algorithms. You know, why is that? If you have random bits inside the algorithm, in some sense it smudges things out a little bit. And so some of the details about pivot rule decisions, if you know about pivot rule decisions, you need to be careful about which column to pivot in or out and sort of informally it's because you might get stuck in a corner. And the randomization smudges things out a little bit, so you're a little bit more robust. So the algorithms can be simpler. Um, more interpretable, interpretable algorithms. This is a little less obvious, but I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail because it'll map cleanly to the scientific applications. If you're in an application, you want to get domain insight. Um, because there's randomness inside the algorithm, the usual theorem is, worst case, um, you know, I want to solve least squares or low rank or something. Theorem, you know, I can be faster than the traditional algorithm and I'm only a little bit worse. Right, so the usual sort of thing. But in addition, because there's randomness inside the algorithm, sometimes that randomness sort of implicitly smudges things out in a statistical sense and gives you implicit regularization properties. So sometimes the algorithms are better than that worst case theory would suggest because they fold regularization inside the algorithm. Um, they'll exploit modern computer ar architectures. You can reorganize steps of the algorithm to take advantage of communication and, and, and a range of other things. And um, very, very large data. It can only be stored in uh, slow secondary memory or in a, in a distributed environment. And the general idea here is going to be um, you randomly sample columns or rows or entries, you know, things, but usually columns and rows. If you're modeling the data as a matrix and you're computing correlations and things, columns and rows are the natural things to think about, right? because Euclidean spaces are about their column spaces and row spaces. So um, generally, you can do other things, but generally you'll sample columns and rows. <coughs> now, you can easily, you can always do it uniformly, and if the data are sufficiently nice, uniform is fine, right? But of course, the data typically aren't that nice. And so you need to do it in a smart way. So you need to use some carefully constructed important sampling probabilities. And you construct some sort of randomized sketch. Um, there, the details are going to be how to compute those important sampling probabilities. And if you want to be naive, then no faster than solving the exact algorithm. If you want to be smart, you can call a black box that runs faster than the exact algorithm, and that black box has a random projection in it. Alternatively, depending on what exactly you want, you can just pre-process the matrix with a random projection. And obviously, that takes the same amount of time uh, as the random projection inside this black box. Pre-process the matrix with a random projection to form a sketch um, and essentially what random projections do is rotate you to a basis where these important sampling probabilities are, are, are uniform. All right, so there's a non-uniformity structure in the Euclidean space, but a random projection rotates you to a random basis, sample uniformly. That's what random projections do. So then you have a sketch that either is the canonical basis or the randomly rotated basis, and you, do one, and, and, and you use the sketch to compute an approximate solution 
to the original problem. So you get a sketch, chew on that sketch, you get an epsilon approximate answer. Alternatively, if you want to do an iterative algorithm, you can use that sketch as a preconditioner. So you can pre-process the input in one of two ways, smart important sampling probability distribution or random projection, and you get a sketch. And then on that sketch, you do one of two things. You either solve the subproblem and you get a low precision solution. That's fine for a lot of analytics applications. Or you use that as a preconditioner and you iterate with the traditional iterative algorithm, and that's what you want to do for high precision solutions. Um, so if, if you're interested in sort of this elephant in the room and getting beyond everyone sort of revealing more about their background experiences and the, the data at hand, these sorts of randomized matrix algorithms are actually a nice use case for sort of bridging the theory practice gap, but also bridging a couple different areas of theory. If you were to look back in 2005 and you were to say what's going on with these, everyone inside theory of algorithms and convex geometry and so on would say this is wonderful theory and it's beautiful and there's lower bounds and you can't do better. And everyone outside that area would say this stuff's useless. And the, and the reason is that, it, it, well, the reason that it is that back then it wasn't useful, but sort of under the hood if you understood what it was doing, you could reparameterize things, you could ask slightly different variants of the questions, you could close that gap. And so now, 2005, so it's eight years later, nine years later, you do have practical applications in numerical analysis and machine learning, statistics, a bunch of data applications. There's been some devel algorithmic developments on how to speed up the random projections using something called fast johnson linden strauss transforms, relative error algorithms as opposed to additive algorithms, so much, much stronger theory, numerically stable algorithms, good statistical properties, a range of different things outside the theory, whether you care about the numerical implementations, whether you care about the machine learning, and a range of different metrics. So how do you bridge this gap? And, and in essence, Inside the analysis, you decouple the randomization from the linear algebra. So that's a, sort of a technical thing. Um, and there's a couple examples of it, and I'll give you the simplest example. And the simplest example highlights the importance of the statistical leverage scores. And these are actually what you use as the important sampling probabilities um, in the simplest case. So what are leverage scores? <clears throat> so let's define these things for a tall matrix. All right, if you're a tall matrix, so given any tall n by d matrix A, let u be any orthogonal matrix for the span of A. So U is the left singular vectors, or U is Q from a QR decomposition, or any other basis. So the columns of U are all unit length and orthogonal. The rows are not, right? U is just any orthogonal matrix. So U could be D columns from the identity, U could be D columns from a Hadamard, U could be a range of different things. And what we're interested in is the row lengths of U. The columns of unit length and orthogonal, the row lengths could be very uniform or very non-uniform. And let's say that the statistical leverage score is the ith one is equal to, this is the, Euclid, the Euclidean norm of the ith row of u. So your tall matrix, you read off the row lengths. Those are the leverage scores. Equivalently, they're the diagonal elements of the projection matrix onto the span of u. So you take your matrix A, you ask about the projection onto A, and you look at those diagonal elements. And some, they could be all the same in some cases if the data are nice, or they could be very non-uniform. We'll get back to how they might look. Um, in a particular application. So the way we're going to use this, and, and there's extensions of that to fat matrices and low rank parameters and so on, but in the simplest case, that's what it is. So the way we're going to use this is, say, a particular application in, in genetics. So in genetics, you have the human genome. It's three billion base pairs long. Everyone has the same the human genome, but everyone's a little bit different. There's a range of ways people can be different, a number of different types of polymorphic variations. The simplest may be for large-scale data analysis, something called single nucleotide polymorphisms. So these are a single base in the three billion where a non-negligible fraction of the people have one base pair or another. So most of the three billion base pairs, you know, everyone has a C right there, and from both parents, in fact, so two Cs. You know, everyone has a you know, G right there. But at some base pairs, a non-negligible fraction has a C and a non-negligible fraction has a G, or a C and an A, right? So you can imagine HapMap, there's 400 people by roughly a million SNPs. There's more recent studies to get the, both dimensions larger. And people are interested in this for personalized medicine, you know, population, uh, genetics, a range of different reasons. So there's a bunch of data sets available. This is one illustrating one of the ones that um, we'll, we've looked at. We've looked at a bunch of these. And one way to analyze a data set like this is to compute the singular value decomposition which, you know, as, you, as you probably know, relies on, on least squares sort of under the hood. And uh, the singular value decomposition takes any matrix A and expresses it as a product of U times sigma times V transpose. U is an orthogonal matrix. V is an orthogonal matrix. They're sometimes called singular vectors or eigenvectors. 
and sigma is a diagonal matrix with non-negative entries. And the important thing is they're non-negative entries. You can order them from largest to smallest. The important thing is keeping the top k singular vectors provides the best rank k approximation to A. This is low rank PCA if you're familiar with that, right? In a range of senses, spectral, Frobenius, a bunch of different norms. So you can write left eigenvectors, singular vectors, right eigenvectors or singular vectors, and a diagonal matrix. Cut off everything but the top k, all the bottom guys, and you have the best approximation to A in a bunch of senses of the word. So here's what you get. If you keep um, a data set like the one we had a couple slides back and project it onto the top three principal components. So color coded, so I showed you the worldwide data set we had. Color coded, here's Africa, you go through the Middle East, you know, East Asia, Oceania, all the way to East Asia. Native American Indians, Mexicans sort of interpolate between Europe and America. So this is visual support of, you know, the, the basically the out of Africa hypothesis, which is the hypothesis for how people, you know, homo sapiens left Africa and migrated the rest of the world. So this is great, right? You know, you project under three dimensions, you say, you get, you get some, reproduce something you understand. Um, this is actually nice. On the other hand, it's not, you know, altogether satisfactory. So here's a nice picture. You're projecting onto three eigenvectors and you get something that makes sense to the geneticist. The geneticist will actually say, yeah, we know that. They'll want more, but makes sense to the geneticist. Not altogether satisfactory. We'll get to why that is. Um, but you should realize there's nothing special about genetics here, right? In astronomy, you're getting all sorts of uh, large-scale data. And what would you want to do there? So there would the data look like you have a telescope, you look up in the sky, and you get an emission band with emission and absorption lines. Say it's 4,096 bands and you have 100 million stars. So now you have a matrix that's 4,000 by 100 million. And one thing that the astronomers want to do, a range of different things, but one thing they want to do is find in an automated way particular frequency filters. You know, they want to find this band right there and that band right there. Um, and they want to do that for astrophysical reasons. They want to do that because they want to filter the telescopes. Um, so a number of different reasons. And this particular problem is called um, lick indices. They want to find lick indices. Lick indices are, are Spec frequency bands that, did that, that are particularly informative for certain astronomical applications. So the point is that if you model this by a 4,000 by 100 million matrix, what they're asking for is to find a small number of actual columns of the matrix, or actual rows of the matrix, right? The frequency bands correspond to columns, as does each image. Columns or rows, depending on how you orient the matrix. And so if they're asking for a small number of lick indices, actual frequencies, because that's useful for the downstream astrophysical application, they're asking for a small number of columns. So why isn't the SVD altogether satisfactory in the genetics application? And if you think about 4,000 by 100 million matrices in the astrophysical application, it's not altogether satisfactory either. And there's two reasons for this. One is that, um, well, computing singular vectors and singular values is relatively fast compared to more expensive things. By the time you get to be 4,000 by 100 million, it's, it's actually, uh, it takes a bit of effort, you know, or even 4,000 by a million. So that's not a one-liner in MATLAB. You need to be careful about how you multiply things and so on. So you can do 4,000 by a million, but if you do you know, 10,000 to your m machine right here, it's not going to be able to do that unless it was bought yesterday. And if it was bought yesterday, it can't handle 12,000, right? So something at that scale, it's going to start to choke. And getting up above about a million is going to have problems also, just to set a rough size scale. So, you know, computing large SVDs actually takes a chunk of time, and you don't want to compute one of them, you probably want to compute a thousand of them as part of a cross-validation experiment. Um, and this is true, and I'm not being stupid here, this isn't the full SVD, this is even if you do, you know, truncated SVDs and so on and so forth. Um, so actually computing it, you know, takes a while. The other thing is, what are those frequency, what are those axes that we projected onto? You know, we projected in the genetics application onto three axes. What are those axes? So those axes are eigenvectors, they're singular vectors. Right, so those are mathematically well-defined. They're a linear combination of all the SNPs that maximizes the variance. In the astrophysical application, they're a linear combination of all the frequency bands that maximizes the variance. So if you walk to the geneticist and you say, what does this linear combination of a million SNPs mean to you? They'll say nothing. Right, it doesn't mean anything to them. If you say, here's an actual column, here's an actual SNP, they'll say, yeah, we know what that means. This is in this part of the genome. It encodes for this gene or not. Um, this is known to be a part of the genome where there's a strong selection effect, so they'll know what an actual gene means, but not a linear combination of genes. So, you know, an algorithmic question is I want to find a small number of actual columns that capture the structure of the top principal components. So let's say I've chosen K, the rank parameter, via some model selection rule. You could say, listen, I want to find the K actual columns that are best. 
and how good are those compared to the SVD? And if they aren't quite good enough, you know, what if I choose K plus 2 or K plus 10? So can I find a small number of actual columns that capture what the SVD captures? So that's going to be an algorithmic question here. So I want to do things faster, and I may want actual columns. And the reason you want to do things faster is because the data is getting larger. The reason you may want actual columns is um, because the scientists can understand what the actual columns mean. All right, so let me give you sort of now switch back to least squares and give you a rough summary of um, ways you can think about this problem and then tell you how you can solve these two particular questions, um, the extension to low rank matrix problem. So back off to least squares now. So now we're back tall again to least squares and you have your matrix A. Remember the projection matrix under the span of A, the diagonal elements of that projection matrix are your leverage scores. And AX minus B. So you're interested in over-constrained LP, but L2 regression problems, and there's typically no such vector x such that AX equals B, and so you want to find the best such vector x. So not the only, but a natural way to construct the best such vector x is to look at the least squares problem, minimize the residual AX minus B. Um, so very natural statistical interpretation, very natural geometric interpretation. Um, how long does it take to solve that problem if your matrix is N by D? So it takes n times d squared time. So it's linear in the high dimension and quadratic in the low dimension. And you know, that's fine if n and d are 100 or something, but if n is, is, is a million and d is a couple thousand, that starts to get to be uh, expensive. And if uh, d is, is 10,000 or 50,000 and n is 100 million, that's you know, not something you're going to be able to do. So n times d squared. So <clears throat> here's sort of the basic meta-algorithm for, for randomized matrix algorithms. And um, you can instantiate this in a bunch of different ways and get a bunch of different variants that are more or less appropriate for different applications. But the basic idea is the following. I have the over-constrained least squares problem. I'm n by d. And I want to solve, minimize the Euclidean norm of ax minus b. Um, <clears throat> a times the pseudo, a, the pseudo inverse of a times b is your solution. So this is the normal equations. This is what you get from QR. I just wrote it a different way. So this is a formal way to write it, but it's a, the pseudo inverse of A times B. Think of that as the inverse of A times B, but since you're rectangular, the inverse isn't defined. So this is the more Penrose pseudo inverse. Randomized meta algorithm. So I'm tall. Um, construct an important sampling distribution that is our friend, the leverage scores, you know, that, that's proportional to leverage scores. So it's the leverage scores up to scaling. We'll say how to compute that in a second, because if you compute it the wrong way, it's no faster than solving the original problem. We'll get back to that in a second. And if you're n by d, the high dimensions n, the low dimensions d. So randomly sample d log d, low dimension log low dimension, divided by epsilon rows or elements from a and b. So you're sampling low dimension number of constraints, low dimension log low dimension number of constraints. Solve the subproblem. The solution to the subproblem, if you, if you sort of formally represent the sampling process since you're pre-multiplying A, you're working on the rows, if you formally represent the sampling process with a matrix S, you're looking at SA, the pseudo inverse of that, times SB. So the same thing here, except it's on the, on the SA, which is a small problem. Solving the small problem is, quote, easy, because you've removed the high dimension, right? It's, it's, if you're dealing with a D log D by D matrix, it's D cubed time. Now, there's going to be theory practice gap and trade-offs. What if d cubed is, you know, starts to bump into the size scale of n and so on? But, I mean, that's, that's a second-order effect, and when you implement these things, that's basically what you spend your time worrying about. Um, solve the subproblem. <clears throat> so the rub here is that, so, so if, if you solve the subproblem, you're going to be 1 plus epsilon good. In, in a bunch of senses of the word, and in very strong senses of the word. So relative error approximation. Unfortunately, it takes naively, you know, you need to compute the left singular vectors, or QR, to compute those leverage scores. So two algorithms. One, fast random projection algorithm. So use a fast Hadamard-based projection. You can use fast Fourier techniques to do this. It's a diagonal plus minus one matrix times a Hadamard matrix, basically. So there's a couple different variants of this. So pre-process the input with a fast Hadamard transform. Since you can use fast Fourier techniques, that takes roughly, um, that takes roughly n times d log d time. So faster than nd squared, little o of nd squared. 
What that does, as I told you, is uniformize the leverage squares. You've rotated to a basis where that's uniform. Not exactly, but approximately. There's, there's a slight fluctuation. But you can sample uniformly in the randomly rotated space. When you sample uniformly in the randomly rotated space, since I told you that you've uniformized the leverage scores, the leverage scores are uniform in that basis. So sample uniformly. Now, they're not perfectly uniform, so you need to oversample a little bit. But basically, you go to a place where they're uniform, and you appeal, that, appeal to that same meta-algorithm. Solve the induced subproblem. Done. Or compute the, the leverage scores. In fact, compute a 1 plus epsilon approximation to all the leverage scores in little o of nd squared time. And use that approximation as the important sampling probabilities. They're a little bit off. Oversample slightly. Done. So you compute a fast approximation to them. How do you compute a fast approximation to them? So essentially, the leverage scores, think of them as depending on the left singular vectors, the left singular subspace. What you do is a random projection matrix on A and compute an approximate QR decomposition. Not the exact QR, but an approximate QR. And you do that from a sketch of the matrix A that itself is constructed from a random projection. So this takes random projection time, N d log d time. So both of these take the same amount of time. And if you solve the subproblem for both of these algorithms, you get a 1 plus or minus epsilon approximation on the objective function and on the certificate. So very good notion of approximation. In N times d, I said n d log d, here's the expression. You n d log d log n over epsilon plus d cubed log n log log something else, right? So this is, um, and if you want to get slightly finer, you can, this is actually one step beyond the, you know, the slightly tighter bound, and it depends on a lot of parameters. Um, but this is sort of the nicest trade-off in, in the space of, of parameters. But the relevant point here is that it's n times d log d time, all right? Now, that's of interest theoretically. How does this perform in clock time, right? The constants could be a million or who knows what, right? So clock time. So there's been a bunch of um, implementations of these. And these basically use a randomized sketch. You can solve the subproblem. Most of the implementations want to compare to LAPAC code or something like that. So here, take that sketch, use it as a precondition or call an iterative algorithm. Um, and the first nice clean evaluation. So this is something we have actually that it implements this in a parallel environment. But one step before that was Avram and Toledo. They have blend and pick. Um, in, in the intro to their paper, they, they conclude. So bl blend and pick is do a random projection of the front side to rotate to a random basis with a Hadamard type transform um, and use that as a preconditioner. Lots of smart engineering implementations. And so their conclusion is that blend and pick beats LAPAC's direct dense least square solver by a large margin on essentially any tall dense matrix. So they're interested in solving to machine precision. They're interested in clock time, you know, the wall clock time, not, not theory. And they say that not for some esoteric problem that you know, is, was invented yesterday, but for least squares on essentially any tall dense matrix, that go head to head with LAPAC that's been um, developed and, over, and optimized for the last 30 years. And these randomized matrix algorithms you know, beat it by a large margin. So that's actually a remarkable claim. And the empirical results show the potential of using random sampling algorithms and suggest that random projection algorithms should be incorporated in a future version of, of LAPAC. So the funding cycles of this takes time, but that's in progress. All right, so that's the basic theory. So if you understand that, then you, know, you understand 90% of the stuff that's going on in randomized matrix algorithms. What you need to do is identify a non-uniformity structure and either sample with respect to it or do a projection that rotates you to a random basis where that's uniform. So if you want actual columns, clearly you don't want to rotate to a random basis. But if you want a subspace, that may be fine. If you want actual columns, you need to find that non-uniformity structure. So it really depends on the problem you want to ask. And, and in both, if you just want a basis, like you know, compute the best rank three approximation of the matrix, project all your data down to it, which is what we did on that slide a couple of slides back with the genetics data, do a projection. If you want to get actual columns, um, don't do a projection. Um, find the non-uniformity structure. Okay, so lots of randomized algorithms for low-rank matrix approximation. I told you the least squares, um, 10,000 feet, least low rank, it boils down to you know, something like least squares, because when you find the best singular vectors, you're solving a, a least squares type problem. So algorithmically, it's done in a little bit different way, and there's a bunch of other details. But you can do random sampling to get CX or CUR decompositions that depend on actual columns and rows. You can do random projections, column subset, a bunch of numerical implementations. So a lot of work in this area on sort of low-rank approximations. So remember, SVD is left singular vectors, diagonal matrix, right singular vectors. So this is a basis for the column space, U. 
What else is a basis for the column space U? So another basis for the column space U is not the left singular vectors, it's the actual columns. So instead of having U times some matrix, could you have C, actual columns, times some matrix? If you do that, then you found a bunch of actual SNPs or a bunch of actual astronomical indices, express all the data elements with respect to them. So, um, so we had two issues before. One was the runtime, and one was the interpretability, and these two issues are connected. First of all, there exists one plus epsilon good columns, not k, but k log k of them. Um, and in addition, the algorithm to find them basically says, I'm going to solve least squares on the full matrix. We can identify those columns with a simple statistic, namely the leverage scores. Those are expensive to compute if you do it naively, but if you do a smart random projection at the front end, you can approximate them. So this doesn't immediately imply a faster algorithm for actually finding those columns or for the low rank problem, but when combined with random projections, it does. And this almost boils down to understanding least squares. So just to wrap up and show you a couple sort of pretty pictures to illustrate um, how you might solve these problems in the genetics application, x-axis, see this is actually microarrays, but for the simplicity, I guess this is actually SNPs here. Uh, SNPs along an ordering. The y-axis here is the leverage scores. The leverage scores are a notion of outliers in statistics. You look at which data elements have a, have a score factor two or three higher than average and flag them as an outlier. So this has been used in regression diagnostics. What you see here is I flag the large leverage scores. These are things that the classical regression diagnostician would say, these are the outliers. Flag them, there's probably a problem. Probably someone kicked the machine. Now think about why we're doing PCA here. We're doing PCA because other things are more expensive, not because we think that the Gaussian assumptions underlying PCA are right for the SNPs, right? Each SNP is a single event in human history. There's nothing Gaussian going on there. So it should be not surprising that relative to a model that we know is wrong, there's a bunch of outlying things high leverage things. So it's a fair question to say, are these mistakes? Did someone kick the machine? Or are these the most interesting data points? And the short answer is the geneticist is to say these are the most interesting data points. If you pull these out randomly with smart greedy heuristics, pull these out, project the data onto that, you get a nice clustering structure, a bunch of other things. Or you can pull out Africans, Europeans, Asians, and a bunch of other things like that. All right, so these are genetics venues, namely reviewed by people who don't know or care about the theory I just described. All right, so I showed you one pretty picture here, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff evaluated by geneticists who find this interesting by genetic criteria. You can solve the same thing in the astrophysical uh, application. This appeared in Astrophysical Journal earlier this year. You can find line indices that are of interest to them. Again, evaluated by the astronomers who don't know or care about that lovely theory. Implementations in parallel and distributed environments. The one side slide summary is implement the same meta algorithm. Worry about communication and not flops. Communication is expensive, but computation is free. So when you get into the weeds, maybe you shouldn't do um, you know, conjugate gradient-based iteration because that's more communication expensive. Do something like Chebyshev's semi-iterative method that has one synchronization point per iteration rather than two. So implement the same ideas, but in a way that worries about uh, communication. Um, that's the one sentence summary, and, and there's a lot more details, but let me not get into those. So, a lot of recent progress on the theory and implementations and applications of randomized matrix algorithms. Um, so hopefully that give you a flavor of that. A couple recent reviews, um, and it's a great model to sort of bridge the gap between large-scale scientific data analysis and more general types of uh, algorithms. Um, so with that, let me wrap up, and some of you may know, and some of you may not, just as an FYI. So we started the MMDS meeting a number of years ago um, to address some of these algorithmic and statistical questions at the heart of large-scale data analysis. We run it every two years, and we'll be, we'll be running it again next month up at Berkeley. So if any of these themes um, looked of interest to you um, and you're around, it would be great to see you there. So with that, let me wrap up. <laughs>